Welcome back everyone to another Space News update with me. Guys, we've got so much to talk about regarding SpaceX's Starship, as well as lots of launches that are coming up this week, one of them being a particularly inspirational one, as well as a recap of all the launches we saw last week. So let's not waste any more time beginning the episode, let's jump into our first segment, which as always is all the updates we saw last week with SpaceX's Starship. <laughs> Last week, we saw lots of progress with Starship, ship number 20, and booster 4. On Monday, ship 20 had all of her sea-level Raptor engines installed, ready for the vehicle to begin testing. The fact that SpaceX are installing engines before any testing has taken place really goes to show how confident they are in the Starship design, though it's worth noting that this isn't a new thing for them. SN11 had its engines fully installed before it underwent testing, although hopefully ship 20 is a little bit more successful than the late SN11. 10, 11. <laughs> we can imagine that the testing campaign for Ship 20, and indeed Booster 4, will follow the same line of testing that the previous prototypes have followed. First ambient testing, then cryo, then static fire. For Ship 20, we'll probably see separate static fires for the sea level and vacuum raptors, and possibly separate static fires for the sea level engines from both the main and header tanks. For those fairly new to the scene, the reason why Starship has two sets of tanks are because when it comes to landing, the belly flop position will cause all of the fuel in the main tanks to just slosh to the bottom, making it extremely difficult to pump to the engines. SpaceX's solution is to have smaller tanks dedicated just for the landing burn so that they'll remain full and pressurized for the belly flop, flip and landing procedure. As for the static fire testing of Booster 4, we'll probably see an initial static fire of 3 to 9 Raptor engines, with SpaceX gradually building up the numbers until we see all 29 roaring. It'll probably look like a much bigger and more epic version of the 20 27 Merlin engine static fire for the Falcon Heavy, seen here. Lots of logistics will need to be involved with such a massive static fire, and eventually launch. The vibrations from the noise alone could be very destructive to surrounding structures if not carefully suppressed with a water deluge system, which I'm sure SpaceX will have completed in time for testing. It doesn't look like there's too much of a wait for the first of Booster 4 static fires. SpaceX are reportedly targeting this week for the first test. Will it be three Raptors, or nine, or something else? What do you think? Let me know down below. And hey, while you're down there, hit that like button. It really helps support these videos, and I always do appreciate it. And subscribing, if you're not already, will mean that you get these videos delivered straight to your sub box every Monday, so that you never miss out on any Starship or Space News updates. Anyway, last week we saw Booster 4 roll back out to the orbital launch pad, where it was then subsequently mounted, ready for its testing campaign. SpaceX's target of static fire this week would be amazing to see, but I think we have to have somewhat reserved expectations, as a lot needs to happen before this. Engineers will need to complete the fuel propellant lines and finish the orbital fuel farm, bring it to operational status and successfully test its systems, and then there's the need to clear the launch area of construction equipment and install firewalls and berms, separating the fuel farm from the launch table to protect stage zero in the event of an anomaly, and of course there's the obvious issue of exposed propellant lines lines and trenches that are yet to be covered up. Booster 4 can't be tested until the fuel farm and its infrastructure are complete. Luckily, the orbital tank farm is coming along very well. Last week, GSE Tank 7 was sleeved, and GSE Tank 8 is now tantalizingly close to completion. Brendan Lewis never fails to supply us with these excellent overview diagrams of exactly what's happening down at Starbase. You can see that now Booster 4 is out of the high bay, SpaceX can now start using the high bay for Booster 5 operations, and given the rapid pace that SpaceX can build these things, should anything happen to Booster 4 that causes it to be pulled, Booster 5 will be able to take its place. Assuming that Booster 4 will pass the tests and be used for the first orbital flight, Elon has mentioned on Twitter that Booster 5 will hopefully be the first super heavy that SpaceX will attempt to catch using the orbital launch tower Mechazilla arms, so it's very exciting to see SpaceX get closer to this goal. I am really looking forward to the day that we'll see multiple Super Heavy and ship stacks on separate launch pads. I remember how crazy it was to see SN9 and SN10 both out on display together, and seeing two gigantic full stack starships next to each other will be insane to a whole nother level. Eric created this amazing render of what Starbase will potentially look like in 2023, to which Elon replied 2022, showing real confidence there that SpaceX will be building big in relatively little time. 
So, when will the first flight be? That's the question on everyone's minds, right? Well, it's difficult to say. Assuming both Ship 20 and Booster 4 sail through testing, there's the issue of getting permission to perform the orbital flight. There's currently no news on when the FAA will publish the draft response to SpaceX's proposed flight plan, and once they do, there will then be a 30-day comment period, an amendment period, and then SpaceX will need to apply for the launch license. So, without wanting to sound overly negative, we're probably looking at a launch date at some point in November or December. I am always happy to be proven wrong though. <laughs> Ship 20 looks like it's making good progress towards being ready for orbital flight. For the past few weeks, we've seen engineers surrounding its nose cone assessing its thermal protection tiles, marking broken ones that need replacement in red, and ones that need repositioning in green. We've been seeing the number of marked tiles rapidly decrease over the last few weeks, and at present it looks like there's not many tiles left to check at all now. Here's hoping the ship has the protection necessary to withstand the insanity of Mach 25 re-entry speeds. That's no small feat. As a side note on Starship updates, SpaceX recently released this official render of a crewed Starship launch. Interestingly, it's been updated so that the booster grid fins are extended during the flight, but the ship's forward flaps aren't in the new flap position, as illustrated here in a render by Eric. And the heat shield tiles don't extend beyond the flaps like they do on Ship 20. Perhaps the art department needs to talk more closely with the engineering department. <laughs> anyway, that's all from me for Starship this week. Do you think I missed anything important? Let me know in the comments down below. But for now, let's move on to our next segment, all the news from the rest of the space industry last week. On the 7th of September, we saw the successful launch of a Long March 4C, which took flight from the Taiwan Satellite Launch Center. The passenger, a GFN-502 Earth Observation Satellite, was successfully deployed into low Earth orbit. After this, we saw another launch from China on the 9th of September, this time a Long March 3BE carrying a Chinasat 9B, a replacement for Chinasat 9A, into geosynchronous Earth orbit. The final launch of the week was also on the 9th of September, this time by Russia. This was the launch of the Razbeg-1, or Cosmos 2551 reconnaissance satellite into low Earth orbit aboard a Soyuz 2.1V from the Plesetska launch site. This was a Ministry of Defense satellite, so little is known about it, but it's definitely in orbit now, so congratulations to Roscosmos on a successful launch. Not that I'm surprised, given the famous reliability of the Soyuz, but it's fun to watch the rocket fly without its signature four boosters, which weren't necessary for a payload of this low mass. Aside from launches, we also learned some exciting news about the James Webb Space Telescope last week. NASA announced that they are targeting a launch date of December the 18th, 2021, and Ariane Space posted some photos of the Ariane 5 rocket core stage arriving at the French Guiana Space Center. I absolutely cannot wait to watch this epic mission unfurl over the next few months. Make sure you stay tuned to Space This Week for updates on this mission. Also last week, Firefly Aerospace released this video of their Firefly Alpha launch and confirmed that the launch failure was caused by an unexpected shutdown of one of the rocket's four engines shortly after lift off. I admire that Firefly aren't afraid of publishing all the warts of their test flights. At the end of the day, while the flight wasn't a success, very few new rockets succeed on their maiden voyage, and Firefly certainly got lots of good data to facilitate future development and flights, so here's hoping that the next launch from the company will see the payload make it all the way into space. Anyway, there's an awful lot of exciting launches coming up this week, including a very inspirational one, so let's move on to all the upcoming news for the next few days. The first launch of the week will be a Chinese Long March 2C on the 13th of September, which will carry two Yeogen reconnaissance satellites into low Earth orbit from the Chuquan launch site. Next up, on the 14th of September, we have another Starlink launch. It's been a while since we saw a Starlink launch. In this, the first launch of the third Starlink shell, the satellites will launch from the Vandenberg launch site in California into a 70-degree orbital inclination, which is a first for Starlink. The Falcon 9 first stage will touch down around 640 kilometers downrange on the Of Course I Still Love You drone ship, marking, if all goes to plan, the 100th successful Falcon mission in a row. Moving on, the next launch will be a Soyuz 2.1B, which will be launching from the Baikonur launch site on the 14th of September. 
On board will be 34 OneWeb communication satellites, which will be placed into low Earth orbit. While not quite at Starlink numbers, OneWeb is nonetheless making very good progress in its communication satellite network, and it's currently the second largest satellite constellation in orbit behind Starlink. Now it's time for the big one. Yes, next up is the long-awaited Inspiration4 launch. This Crew Dragon orbital flight will take off from the Kennedy Space Center on the 16th of September. This will be the first ever orbital flight to have an all-civilian crew. Jared Isaacman, the billionaire businessman, pilot, and funder of the flight, will be commanding the mission, and he also purchased two additional tickets on behalf of St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. One of the tickets was given to Haley Arsenault, a physician assistant at the hospital and an ex patient of theirs. She was treated for bone cancer as a child and will be the youngest American in space at the age of just 29. The other ticket was raffled off on behalf of the hospital. The prize winner rejected the ticket and gave it to their friend, Christopher Sembrowski, an employee of Lockheed Martin who has a keen interest in space and astronomy. Also on board will be Cyan Proctor, a pilot and geology professor, science communicator, and now commercial astronaut. This flight has already raised $9 million for St. Jude's, but the crew are hoping that this inspirational launch will raise $200 million in donations. I'll put a link to donate to the hospital down in the description below. The crew have received commercial astronaut training by SpaceX, learning orbital mechanics, how to manage emergencies, how to operate in the microgravity environment of Earth orbit, stress testing, mission simulations, and of course, learning about the Falcon 9 and Crew Dragon space capsule. This will be the second flight for the Crew Dragon space capsule Resilience, which first flew on the Crew-1 mission on the 2nd of May 2021. It has received one major modification though. Since this mission won't involve docking with the International Space Station, the capsule's docking port has been replaced with this glass dome, which will offer absolutely spellbinding views of the Earth and space. The capsule will remain in orbit for three days, after which it'll splash down in the Atlantic Ocean. This is an extremely exciting flight, being the first all-private citizen flight, and it paves the way for orbital space tourism. Maybe one day we'll all get the opportunity to launch into space. I think, as lame as it sounds though, I'd rather stick to short flights like New Shepard or Virgin Galactic Spaceship myself. I have a horribly weak stomach, and I don't think I'd handle Zero-G particularly well. <laughs> Finally, we round off the week's launch calendar with a launch from China. A Kuaishu 1A will carry Jilin-1, an Earth observation satellite, into low Earth orbit on the 19th of September. And that's it for all the key dates to mark in your calendar for this week, which I guess wraps up this part of the video and also, I guess, just the video itself. Thank you guys so much for watching. There are links to social media on screen if you want to follow me or join my Discord or Reddit or, or any of those other cool things. Uh, there are also some Patreons scrolling on the left if you want to join their magnificent ranks and you could do so by clicking the on-screen link or via the link in the description or you could join my channel as well. That's below the video. Get some emojis to put in the comments and you get a little badge next to your name to prove to everyone that you're the children is better than them. There are also uh, two suggested videos on screen for my channel that hopefully you'll like. Hopefully that was great, wasn't it? Really should start scripting these outros, shouldn't I? Anyway, that's it. Thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you next Monday.